Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is Miliaria neutrophilic eccrine hyperadenitis, hydradenitis, and disorders of apocrine glands. This lecture is part two of the disorders of sweat glands. So let's proceed to today's lecture. First is miliaria. Miliaria is a common acute or subacute skin condition that arises due to the occlusion or disruption of eccrine sweat, gland, sweat ducts in hot and humid condition. So this topic is very pertinent in today's weather where the temperature is high and there is high humidity. This excessive sweating results in occlusion and disruption of the ducts, leading to miliaria or commonly known as prickly heat. There are three forms of miliaria, miliaria crystallina and miliaria rubra, results in leakage of sweat into the epidermis. So these two are superficial or epidermal conditions. And the third type of miliaria is miliaria profunda, which is due to leakage of sweat in the dermis. So it is a deeper condition. In miliaria crystallina, the obstruction is very superficial. That is at the level of stratum corneum, resulting in formation of a small vesicle, which is subcorneal and contain clear fluid, which is the sweat. In miliaria rubra, the changes which include keratinization occur in the intraepidermal part of the sweat duct and results in uh, erythematous papule with some time a vesicle around it. In miliaria profunda, the rupture of duct occur at uh, the level below the dermoepidermal junction and mainly in the dermis that results in formation of a non-inflammatory papule. So these, this slide shows the different levels of obstruction of the sweat duct in the three different kinds of miliaria. In miliaria crystallina, it is just at the stratum corneum. In miliaria rubra, it is into the epidermis. And in miliaria profunda, it is intradermal. The main contributing causes or risk factors of miliaria include the immature sweat ducts in a newborn. So miliaria crystallina is common in newborn if they are exposed to excessive heat then hot and humid environment will result or trigger malaria in almost all individuals. And it is, the condition gets aggravated if there is intense exercise or physical activity in such conditions. It may be because of fever, high grade, or occlusion of the skin with non-porous dressings like a polythene occlusion, or use of synthetic clothing against the skin, like nylon, nylon fibers or nylon clothes. Then it is also seen in hospitalized or bedridden patients lying on the waterproof mattresses or mattress protectors, again, which are non-porous and resulting in increased heat of the body. There are several diseases and treatments that are associated with miliaria, and this includes the drug-induced hyperhidrosis, adverse reaction to drugs such as chemotherapy, Stephen Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, genetic diseases such as Morvan syndrome or pseudo-hypoaldosteronism type 1, and as a result of radiotherapy. Clinical features. Miliaria crystallina. It is characterized by clear, thin walled vesicles, 1 to 2 millimeter in diameter, without any inflammatory areola. They are usually symptomless, develop in crops mainly on the trunk. In persistent febrile illness, recurrent crops may occur. 
The condition is commonly seen in infants where the eccrine ducts are deficient. These vesicles soon rupture and followed by superficial brainy desquamation. Then miliaria rubra or the prickly heat. Typical lesions develop at site of friction with clothing and in flexures. Lesions are uniform, minute, erythematous papule, which may be present in a very large number. Characteristically, the lesions produce intense discomfort in a form of unbearable pricking sensations, which is the main reason of bringing the patients to skin OPDs. Relief is often instantaneous when stimulus to sweating is stopped by uh, taking the patients out of the hot environment and by cold showers. Then Miliaria Profunda. It is nearly always follow repeated attacks of miliaria rubra and is uncommon except in tropics. Characterized by pale firm papules, 1 to 3 mm across, especially on the body but sometimes seen on the limbs. There is no itching or discomfort from the lesions. Differential diagnoses of miliaria include herpes simplex, fungal infections, bacterial folliculitis, acne, acute generalized exanthemic pustulosis, toxic erythema of newborn and Grover's disease. So in all these conditions, there will be some differences and some similarities with miliaria, different kinds of miliaria. disease course and prognosis. If the environmental factors continue, recurrent episodes lasting from for few days are usual, but the discomfort is continuous. After a few min months, some degree of acclimatization develop and disorders become less prevalent. The most important complication of malaria is the secondary infection. It present as impetigo, or as multiple superimposed staphylococcal abscesses. Now it is referred as malaria pustulosa or periporitis staphylogenes. Permanent damage to sweat duct, duct may occur, especially resulting in malaria profunda. Two other side effects of recurrent malaria is the impaired thermoregulation, resulting in heat strokes, and hyperhidrosis in non-affected area. Then periporitis staphylogenes. This represents an infection of the deep cutis in all probability due to poral sweat closure and subsequent infection by staph aureus. So the point to diagnose this condition is usually a young child in a hot, humid environment characterized by uh, miliaria uh, rubra with superimposed pustules. These pustules are perifollicular, relatively cold to touch, and are not usually associated with fever. The miliaria management. Strategy, strategies to avoid sweating and keeping the skin cool and reducing the irritation is the main focus of the management. So the patient must be advised to work in air-conditioned offices for at least few hours a day, which is of course not possible for outdoor workers. Sleep in ventilated and cool bedrooms. Move away from tropical climate, avoiding the humid weathers. Avoid excessive clothing and tight clothing. So the advice is to wear only single layer of clothing and avoid the undergarments uh, during hot, humid weather when the sweating is more. Avoid excessive soap and irritants. So cool baths without soap. Wear shirts and blouses made of breathable synthetic fibers or cotton. Remove wet clothings. 
why we avoid the undergarments is because of sweating the undergarments become wet and remain wet throughout the day which is uh, one of the reason of developing milly area so these wet clothes should be removed cool water compresses and taking cool baths patients should be educated on symptoms of heat exhaustion as uh, extensive milly area may lead to heat intolerance and heat exhaustion Medical management include calamine lotion, which is effective as anything for relief of discomfort. But because of its drying effect, a bland emollient or oily cream or in menthol or aqueous cream may subsequently be required to prevent further epidermal damage. Then if the condition is uh, infl uh, quite inflammatory, then mild potent topical steroids may be used. In case of infection, antiseptics and anti-staphylococcal antibiotics are prescribed. Oral ascorbic acid 500 mg twice a day was found to diminish the severity of miliaria as was the degree of subsequent anhydrosis in experimentally induced disease. Isotretinoin is reported to be effective in miliaria profunda. Then we are going to discuss the second um, disease and that is the neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis. It's a rare clinical condition that is characterized by acute inflammation of the acrine sweat glands uh, seen in skin biopsies. And there are uh, many different types of neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis which are classified as following. The chemotherapy induced acrine hydradenitis, then infectious neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis, then only the palmoplantar acrine hydradenitis, then neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis associated with HIV and that associated with Bacious disease. Pathophysiology. The key pathological feature of NEH is the necrosis of acrine epithelium suggesting a direct toxicity associated with dense neutrophilic infiltrate. The drugs which are reported to be associated with chemotherapy-induced neutrophilic acrine hyperhydradenitis include bleomycin, carbamazepine, tumor necrotic factor alpha, and cetuximab. Childhood neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis is not associated with any specific disease. NEH is most frequently encountered in immunosuppressed individuals. The causative organisms of infectious neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis include serratia, seret, uh, staphylococci, streptococci, and nocardia. Clinical features. The drug-induced neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis occur within 8 to 10 days of starting chemotherapy. Characterized by painful erythematous papules or plaques on limbs, neck, and face. Facial erythema and swelling may be severe enough to mimic cellulitis. The condition typically resolves in two weeks when the treatment ends. Recurrence, however, may occur with subsequent courses of chemotherapy. Childhood Neutrophilic acrine hydradenitis has a particular predisposition, predisposition to the soles and less often to palms. Typical tender plaques and nodules are seen. Attacks resolve spontaneously in three weeks, but condition is recurrent. So these are erythematous nodules and plaques occurring on limbs, trunk and face mainly. Investigation. If a skin biopsy is done, it shows damage to the acrine ducts with dense neutrophilic infiltrate. Associated neutropenia is also common. Majority of cases resolve spontaneously without any treatment just by stopping the medications. However, in adult, in adult NEH, systemic corticosteroids, dapsone, and colchicine are all prescribed because of the dense neutrophils present in the inflammation. Dapsone is helpful in preventing the recurrence of the condition. 
Then another related condition is the acrine syringosquamous metaplasia. This term is used to describe both the histological changes seen within the acrine sweat gland and also distinct skin eruption that is associated with use of chemotherapeutic agents, most notably cytarabine and protein kinase inhibitors. The predisposing factors are transformation of cuboidal ductal epithelium into squamous epithelium. This is considered to be a non-specific marker of acrine damage and on histology, it may be confused with squamous cell carcinoma. Clinically, the eruptions occur shortly after chemotherapy and spontaneously resolves, characterized by widespread papulovesicular lesions with erythema, and intertrigenous eruption may also be seen. Skin biopsy is usually diagnostic, and the condition resolves spontaneously, but symptom control may be required by different medications that include topical corticosteroids. Drugs and eccrine glands. A number of drugs are concentrated in the eccrine glands. These drugs include sulfagunidines, sulfadiazine, amphetamines, arsenicals, iodides, phenytoin, phenobarbitone, carbamazepine, Grisofulvin, ketoconazole, fluconazole, ciprofloxacin, diamorphine, cocaine, and nicotine. Sweat testing may be used as an alternate urine testing in setting of such substance abuse. Now, the second and important part of this lecture is the apocrine glands and the conditions which are associated with disorders of apocrine glands. The apocrine glands are the sweat glands derive their name from the way their secretion appear by pinching off part of their cytoplasm. These glands develop as a part of pilosebaceous follicles in fourth to fifth month of intrauterine life. In the adult, the characteristic distribution of apocrine glands are in axillae perianal region, and areola of the breast. The memory gland and sero, uh, serominous glands in external auditory meati are also modified apocrine glands. The activity of these glands is androgen dependent and the glands show marked testosterone alpha reductase activity. These glands are larger than the eccrine glands. You can see the uh, differences in size in this picture. And they are situated deep as compared to the eccrine glands, mainly in the subcutaneous tissue. Each gland consists of a tubule and a duct, which is uh, relatively shorter than the eccrine duct and opens into the hair follicle above the sebaceous gland. The apocrine duct closely resembles an eccrine duct and consists of double layer of cuboidal epithelium as seen, in, as seen in the second picture. Free edge of the cells may show apocrine secretion by, and uh, appears as pinching off of the cytoplasm of the cells. Outside the basement membrane, there is a layer of myoepithelial cells that propels the secretion onto the surface. Apocrine glands secrete small quantity of oily fluid. This secretion is odorless uh, as it reaches the surface of the skin, but the bacterial decomposition, which are uh, present in abundance in axilla and in groin, is responsible for production of odiferous compounds. A small quantities of odiferous sulfonyl alkanols uh, and steroids have been identified. The production of these metabolites is under the genetic control of ABCC11 gene. Mutation in this gene is predominantly seen in Southeast Asians, explaining 
the racial variations in body odor. Disorders of apocrine sweat gland. The first is the abnormal sweat odor, also known as the brome hydrosis. Epidemiology, the human skin odor is largely determined by alteration or degradation of odorless substances secreted by apocrine glands by bacteria. And the special, especially the bacteria are the Croinibacterium species. Acrine secretion can contain odor producing substances that are excreted in it, such as drugs, arsenic, and garlic. So in addition to bacterial decomposition, if the patient is taking garlic or arsenic or some drugs, then it, the odor uh, of the sweat may also change. On occasion, the malodor appreciated only by the patients and it may be a symptom of monosymptomatic delusion of malodor or the olfactory reference disorder that require a psychiatric intervention. And apocrine secretion, as apocrine secretion increases, male odor devel usually develops at or after the puberty. The male odor is evident more in men, and there is an N N uh, anecdotal evidence that axillary male odor is more prevalent in European and African individuals and less so in East Asian, Chinese, and Koreans. The presentation may be due to patient being conscious of emitting the odor as a result of comments from friends and relatives. Sniff testing may result in appreciation of character of the odor such as onion-like, beefy, or fruity. So the management of bromhydrosis is omission of foodstuffs such as garlic from the diet, frequent washing of the axillary region, and local antibacterial substances. There is no evidence that measures used to control the axillary acrine hyperhidrosis for example, ammonium salts or anticholinergic drugs has much effect on the apocrine gland secretion. The deuterants are the mainstay of the therapy as the fragrance, fragrances disguise the undesired odor. A silver zeolite powder is shown to have a strong antibacterial effect on axillary microflora and diminish the axillary malodor. Botulinum toxin A is used to treat axillary and genital malodor with good effects. Then lastly, the surgical excision of axillary subcutaneous tissue by a variety of surgical techniques like axillary shave and uh, section of subcutaneous glands, laser ablation, ultrasound ablation, intraepidermal alcohol injection or liposuction, which removes both acrine and apocrine glands is performed with good effects. In those who are dissatisfied with conservative measures. Then another condition related to bromhydrosis is trimethyl amenuria. The disorder results from excessive amount of offensively smelling tertiary amine trimethylamine appearing in acrine and apocrine sweat, breath and urine, and imparting an unpleasant rotten fish smell to the sufferers. Most cases present in late teens or early 20s. Incidence does not vary by gender. The pathophysiology. These individuals are unable to oxidize trimethylamine which is produced by intestinal bacterial degradation of choline and carnitine in the food to odorless trimethylamine and oxide. This is mainly the main problem, primary problem. Then there is a secondary trimethylamine urea 
which occur when there is an increased burden of trimethylamine in conditions such as blind loop syndrome, uremia, and liver disease. So the clinical feature is unpleasant odor, often worse after eating seafood during periods of stresses and during menstruation, which is a source of distress, rejection, and resentment. The condition is diagnosed by direct estimation of trimethylamine in the urine after a marine fish meal. Management first is prescribing a diet low in carnitine and choline. Then egg yolk, legumes, red meat, fish and beans are to be avoided. Short courses of metronidazole or neomycin may be of temporary benefit, which reduces the bacteria that degrade carnitine and choline in the gut. Charcoal and copper chlorophyll are shown to reduce urinary trimethylamine concentration to normal levels in the sufferers. Chrome hydrosis. Chrome hydrosis is the secretion of vividly colored apocrine sweat in up to 10% of the population. It is most commonly blue, yellow or green in color and is of apocrine in origin, seen in axilla, areola, and nipple or the face. It results from secretion of lipofuxin in apocrine sweat and may be associated with colored breast milk. The affected individual's clothes may also fluoresce on wood light illumination. The secretion of colored sweat at puberty and persist until there is a gradual regression of apocrine function in old age. Colored sweat may be discharged from the glands in response to exercise and emotional stimuli and after manipulation of the skin. You can see this yellow or brownish color sweat in this patient. The first line treatment is topical capsaicin. Second line is intralegional botulinum toxin. Then pseudochromohydrosis. This is secretion of clear fluid that changes to color secretion after its exit from the sweat ducts. It occurred due to chromogenic or porphyrin producing bacteria on the skin. In case of facial red chromohydrosis, child responds to erythromycin. Then occupational exposure to copper salt produce blue acrine sweat. Then l urea uprenosis produce a black sweat. This is a blue sweat in pseudochromohydrosis. Then the last condition to be discussed today is the apocrine miliaria or Foxfordyce disease. Apocrine malaria is a disorder of apocrine glands comparable to prickly heat of acrine glands and is caused by obliteration of apocrine duct at the infundibula. It presents with itchy papular eruption in axilla, anogenital area and areola of the nipple and predominantly seen in female. The disease occur mainly in women and after puberty and can be postmenopausal and reported after laser axillary hair epilation, which may also damage the ducts. Itching may be intense, later skin colored or slightly pigmented, doom shaped, follicular papules develop, hair loss in axilla is also common. Itching is often provoked by the emotional stimuli that normally cause the apocrine secretion. The disease run a very prolonged course and may persist until menopause. Some remission may occur in pregnancy. Management. Topical and intrarenal steroids provide some benefit, but the use is limited by atrophy. Topical clindamycin is reported to be effective in some Treatment with four to six weekly doses of ultraviolet radiation causes exfoliation and help in some patients. Topical retinoic acid is helpful. 
So are the oral contraceptives and oral retinoids. Sometimes patients require electrocautery or the surgical excision of affected skin by a subcutaneous removal of apocrine glands. So this brings to end of the chapter and this lecture. I thank you again for patient listening and see you next time with another topic. Thank you very much and have a good day.